Chapter 11 A soft rapping on the door stirred Isabella awake. A dull ache throbbed at her temples. She stared at the stone ceiling overhead. The weight of her heavy heart pinned her to the hard platform bed. She drew a shallow breath and closed her eyes, wishing to retreat into slumber. But the knocking grew louder. Whoever waited outside her cell was not going to leave her to her misery. Wiping sleep from her eyes, she stood and pulled open the door. The tall, stooped monk who had been her guide the night before stood with eyes downcast. Once again, he did not speak but motioned for her to follow. After twisting back the way they'd come, he led her down another dark, cool hallway that let out into a small courtyard. Shadow still hung heavy in the sky. She filled her lungs with fresh, warm air, glad to be free from the confines of the cloisters. But her relief was short-lived. She expelled the breath with distaste. It was a treacherous lie, as potent as any betrayal. Within the tantalising, crisp spring air, one breathed life's beginnings, its very origins, but her life had been stagnant before she had even taken her first breath. It was the same as countless women who had come before her, women with voices unheard, women with passions left to wane until all desire faded. The space afforded her life was a fraction of the size of the monk's starved cells. She was crammed into a dark hole and the world ignored her screams. Her fists clenched. She would relinquish every luxury of the body to feel the richness of soul that only love could provide. She would rejoice in the feel of rough wool on her skin if the hands that swept her tunic from her body stoked her passion. My lady? Her head jerked up and she met Abbot Matthew's kind, patient eyes. She cleared her throat and uncurled her fingers. The wagon is ready. He gestured toward the open gate. Monks with hoods pulled low over their faces waited as if in prayer for her to join them on the benches lining the sides of a rough-hewn wagon. Their solemn reception mirrored her life, disciplined and stark, void of the pleasures that ignite the spirit. Freedom is stolen moments. Jack's words hit her hard in the gut. She was no thief. If freedom was stolen, she was doomed to be chained. She had tasted rapture. Her blood had ignited. Her soul struck deep with a yearning, but now left cold and hollow. How could she return to the echoing grandness of her lonely fortress? She pictured the vast, empty rooms, full of lost dreams and teeming sorrows. Very soon, she would leave behind one prison to join Hugh in another. The towering walls became waves, high and fierce, crashing around her, swallowing her youthful heart. She was not meant to be caged. With word and deed, her parents had taught her that love was as essential to life as food or water. It sustained one's soul. Her tall, gangly monk bowed to her before taking her elbow and helping her climb into the wagon. None of the monks already seated moved from their pious positions while she claimed her place on one of the benches. As they passed through the gates, their carriage pulled by a team of donkeys, she glimpsed the sun peeking out from beneath the horizon. She gave her despair over to the soft pink light. It tinted the morning fog, which writhed and shifted across the surface of a distant lake, but its sensual dance bade her long to feel Jack's lips on her skin. She closed her eyes against the dawn and allowed the countryside to pass unseen. Their journey could never be long enough. Too soon they would be in Berwick. The city walls would be higher than when she left, blocking her view north into Scotland where love dwells. Pounding hooves caused her eyes to open. She stood. A dozen knights approached on horseback, carrying banners bearing the Trevelyan coat of arms. Hugh rode lead. Bella! He had seen her. Her heart pounded her ears. She took a deep breath and prayed for strength. She could not deny her truth. She was Lady Isabella Redisdale. She swept her unbound hair away from her face and knotted it demurely at the nape of her neck. Abbot Matthew! She said, her voice steady, though beneath the surface of her calm façade, she struggled against the inevitable. Stop, please. The Lord approaching is my betrothed. Your what? 
she heard a voice say. She sat down and stared at the monk in front of her. His body was still, his head solemnly bowed. Her eyes followed the outline of broad shoulders. Could it be? She clasped her hands in her lap to conceal how her fingers shook and leaned forward in her seat. Narrowing her eyes, she strained to see through his ink-black hood. Isabella! Hugh's voice jarred her from her trance. I am here, she called, though her eyes remained fixed on the monk. Praise be to Mary and all the saints, you are alive! The wagon shook as Hugh climbed onto the back. She had no choice but to look at her betrothed. He stood with open arms, forcing a smile to her lips. She rose, but shifted her gaze back to the monk in front of her. It had to be him. His closeness stole her breath. All she had to do was reach out and she could once more wrap her arms around his neck. Throw back your hood, her thoughts commanded. Claim me as yours. Still, the monk did not break his solemnity. Hugh crossed to her side. Are you hurt? Can you not walk? Mayhap her heart played with her mind. Mayhap the man across from her was a monk, and in desperation she imagined Jack's voice. She swallowed her hope and turned to face Hugh. His fine, blue eyes held nothing but tenderness and concern. She tried to speak, but the words stuck in her dry throat. My flask, Hugh said to his footman, who hastened to carry out his bidding. She closed her eyes and allowed him to tip the flask to her lips. The rush of liquid brought her throat back to life. At last, she found the will to answer his question. I am well, my lord. He smiled with relief. You cannot imagine my fear. Word of the attack arrived just this morning. He stroked his fingers down her cheek. I thought I would never see you again. She dropped her eyes in shame. Hugh was all things decent and good, her dearest friend from youth. Why could she find no love for him in her heart? Come, my darling, he said, wrapping his arm around her shoulders. I will take you home. She nodded, allowing him to draw her forward. As she stepped past the monk, she let her handkerchief drop from her fingertips at his feet. Gaze downcast, she watched strong fingers dart out from long black sleeves and grab it. Jack. Her chest tightened. She could not breathe. Her legs trembled, ready to give way. Hugh's arm came under her knees and lifted her, holding her close. He pressed a kiss to her brow. I am here now, he whispered. You need not fear, not any more. He passed one of his guards. She listened numbly to his command. Take four men and ride with the monks to Berwick. Lord Reddesdale and I will hear their testimony. The rest of you ride with me. He set her on the saddle, then swung up behind her. Their horse leapt forward as they galloped away. Hugh held her close. I know your heart as well as my own, Bella. I will take you away from here and back to Berwick as fast as my horse will ride. Fresh tears filled her eyes. Regarding the contents of her heart, Hugh could not have been more wrong. Jack remained still, his head bowed as if in solemn prayer, despite how he yearned to cast aside the monk's cloak and chase after Bella and her betrothed. His chest tightened. That fiend of a lord had called her Bella. His fingers curled into tight fists. Of course she was betrothed. After all, she was a lady with title and duty. What had he been thinking? Well, that was just it. He hadn't been thinking, only feeling, yearning for a woman who had no business even talking to the likes of him. Despite her mother's humble birth, she was still an English lady. He glanced down at the handkerchief in his hand. His thumb stroked over the bee, elaborately embroidered with silver thread. So, St Peter is now Brother Peter. Jack's shoulders stiffened. It was Abbot Matthew who spoke. He lifted his head and cast off the black hood. Cool spring air swept over his neck and ears, exposed now by his newly shorn hair. Good morrow, Abbot. The older man gestured to the seat beside him. Jack stood and climbed onto the driver's seat. The abbot snapped the reins and they set off toward Berwick with the English guards in lead. How long have you known it was me? Jack said. 
the abbot smiled. I know every member of my order at a glance, even with their hoods drawn. Jack raised his brows and dipped his head, to show that he knew he had underestimated his old friend. <laughs> anyway, you're twice the size of any monk I've ever known, the abbot said, chuckling. So, which of your brothers is back there? A smile tugged at Jack's lips. Quinn. Ah, uh, I suspected as much, the abbot said. St. Augustine is now Brother Augustine. He shook his head. You ken Bishop Lamberton will not like this. Jack shrugged. It could not be helped. Ah, then you've decided to fight for her. Jack looked the abbot hard in the eye. I'm not leaving Berwick without her. Even if I have to kidnap her again. His gaze shifted. He looked at the road ahead and then at the tired team of donkeys easing them forward at a snail's pace. Eh, uh, could we go any faster? The abbot pulled a little on the reins, slowing their progress. The weight is your penance for lying to me, and stowing away on my wagon. Jack grabbed the reins from the abbot's hands and snapped them hard against Gone. the donkey's backs. I'll go to confession. They surged forward. Forgive me, old friend, but I've a prize to steal. Chapter 12 Jack's eyes passed over the comforts of the Reddisdale Solar. A massive hearth filled one side of the room. Colourful tapestries covered the walls. Elaborately carved high back chairs, like the one he sat in, dominated the room's centre. Doubt gripped his heart. He would never be able to give Bella such comfort, not in ten lifetimes. Exhaling a quiet breath, he bowed his head and forced himself to relax. In front of him sat Lord Hugh Trevelyan, Isabella's betrothed, and to his left, Lord Reddesdale. Isabella's father had glanced their way when Jack, Quinn and Abbot Matthew had first entered his solar, but that was his only acknowledgement of their presence. His gaze remained fixed on the low-burning fire. Given Lord Reddesdale's apparent apathy, Jack was not surprised when it was Lord Trevelyan who first addressed the abbot. Lady Reddesdale's carriage was discovered by Lord Widrington who was marching to Dunbar. His messenger rode first to Berwick Castle where King Edward sits in residence. At once the king ordered dozens of guards north to recover my lady and to find the beasts who butchered her guard. However, Lord Reddesdale and I did not receive word of the attack until this morning. As far as I know, none of the villains have been caught. Lord Trevelyan leaned forward in his seat and stared hard at the abbot. That is all we know. Now it's your turn. How came you to find Lady Reddesdale? The abbot straightened in his seat. Brothers from my order witnessed the attack. He gestured to Jack. Brother Peter was included in their number. Jack raised his gaze from the floor and locked eyes with Lord Trevelyan. Jack was a good judge of character and as much as he wanted to despise the English lord, Jack could not deny his display of honour. Lord Trevelyan had treated the Scottish monks with every due respect. He was attentive to Lord Reddesdale. He had even shown kindness to the servants who had arrived moments after they had entered with trenchers of food and ale. Jack glanced at Quinn. He could not tell Lord Trevelyan the truth of Bella's rescue. After all, they were supposed to be monks, not warriors able to charge on horseback through bands of criminals. Jack cleared his throat. <coughs> we heard the attack from further down the road. Why were you so far from your monastery? Lord Trevelyan interrupted. Jack fought the sudden urge to shift in his chair. Abbot Matthew spoke before Jack could. The road cuts through the outskirts of monastic lands, my lord. My fellow brothers were still within our boundaries. Lord Hugh nodded and gestured for Jack to continue. When we heard the clash of blades, we circled back and hid among the trees, observing the struggle. The lady was pulled from her carriage, but she managed to escape into the woods. We rushed to her aid and retreated deep into the forest. They never found our trail. The image of Bella's near rape flooded his mind, but he forced the memories away. Neither her father nor her betrothed needed to know the great danger Bella had been in. We returned to the monastery with Lady Reddesdale. She was blessed to be free from harm. 
after she had rested, we set out to bring her home. Lord Trevelyan nodded. She is subdued, I'm certain from the shock of the ordeal, but she is uninjured, he frowned. But I am afraid greater harm has been done. Rumours abound, claiming the attack was not the act of common thieves, but rebellious Scottish peasants. I fear this incident will be used to renew border violence. Jack pressed his lips together in a frown and thought back to the attack. Their numbers surpassed twenty men, my lord. I must agree that this was no common raid. Lord Trevelyan shrugged. But twenty is not so great a number if they were exiles. I've heard of such camps existing. Outcasts and outlaws who've come together. Jack nodded. Hidden within the northern forests are small villages of people as you've described. Still, they would not tinker in so large a number, at least not in the daytime. Too many to hide away. Lord Trevelyan expelled a long breath. Then the rumours are true. Damn, Jack heard him mutter. Our borders have been peaceful for some weeks. I, for one, welcomed the respite from war. Jack moved to the edge of his seat. I said it was no simple raid, but I can also tell you they weren't Scottish peasants. Brows drawn, Lord Trevelyan leaned back in his seat. Are you suggesting they were English? Jack shook his head. Whether Scottish or English I cannot say, but I've one certainty. They weren't peasants. How can you be so sure? Surprised, Jack turned to look at Lord Reddisdale, who had been the one to pose the question. The men who attacked your daughter's carriage showed every physical sign of good health. They were men used to an abundant table, and the skill with which they fought belied their meagre dress. Lord Reddisdale did not reply. Once more, he shifted his gaze away from Jack to stare at the flames. A sadness stole into Jack's thoughts. He remembered Bella telling him that following her mother's death, her father had shut life out and her along with it. It was clear to Jack that Lord Reddisdale had retreated into himself. But why? Jack knew the hardship of grief, but grief alone could not have taken Lord Reddisdale from the world. Only shame held that power. But what shame did Bella's father carry? A knock at the door stole Jack's attention. A young maidservant opened the door after Lord Trevelyan gave command. She announced that the hour for supper had arrived. Jack had never been inside one of the large fortresses within Berwick. When he had resided in the city, he had lived in a one-room wooden home shared by himself, his parents and his six siblings. Until now, he had never known that one could be inside and yet feel so entirely unconfined. The ceilings might have grazed the heavens they were so tall. Flickering candlelight resembled stars studding the night sky. After his captain's ship would make port, he had often slept on board beneath the stars, rather than returning to their cramped home. He closed his eyes and for a moment he was out there, once more on the sea, moving to the rhythm of the waves. His eyes flew open and followed ribbons of smoke coiling up from the central hearth, then out a vent in the roof. Already, Bella had the sky. What could he give her? He fought to chase the self-doubt from his thoughts, but his heart felt heavy as his gaze shifted to the mantel place above the hearth, which bore a large shield with the Reddisdale coat of arms. For a moment, he felt as though the grandness were closing in around him. He had no title to give Bella. He could not even offer her an honest name. Jack McVee was a thief. He reached into the deep pocket of his monk's habit and felt her soft handkerchief. Quinn nudged him. "'Tis like a tomb in here.' Jack raised a sceptical brow. "'You've lofty aspirations for your final resting place. Look around you,' Quinn whispered. Jack's shoulders stooped a little further. "'Trust me, I have. It is barren and cold.' At first, Jack did not know what Quinn meant, but then he considered the empty tables and strange, almost eerie silence. At the high dais sat only Lord Reddisdale, who had not looked up from his plate since first taking his seat. Despite the warm fire and bright tapestries, the room was as Quinn had described. Cold. Oppressive gloom pushed out life and laughter. "'Tis no wonder she came looking for you,' Quinn said. Jack raised his eyebrows at his brother. 
She was attacked, her virtue nearly stolen, and then we kidnapped her. She did not set out looking for me. Quinn smiled. Aye, but she did find you, and thank God above for that. She'll suffocate in here. The arched doorway opened, stealing Jack's attention. A manservant came into the room. Lord Trevelyan and Lady Reddesdale, he announced, his voice echoing off the tall ceiling. Jack tensed. This would be the first time he would look upon her since arriving in Berwick. Sweat beaded his brow. Their bench scraped the floor as he, Quinn, the abbot and the other monks stood out of respect for the lady of the house. Jack pressed his lips tight to silence the snarl that fought to be released as Isabella appeared in the doorway on Lord Trevelyan's arm. Her olive skin stood out in sharp contrast against the white of her fitted wimple. Sweeping down from her elaborate headdress were layers of silken veils. He sought her gaze as she passed by, but her eyes remained downcast. His eyes followed her across the length of the great hall and then to the high dais where she sat next to her betrothed. At once, servants brought them ale and one trencher of food to share. He stared at her, willing her to look his way, but she kept her gaze aloft. She looked out the windows, at the hearth, anywhere but at him. He clenched his teeth while Lord Trevelyan leaned close to whisper something in her ear. She smiled at first and then laughed outright. Her gaze held warmth when she looked at her betrothed. He could see her affection for him, even from across the room. Lord Trevelyan looked up then and locked eyes with Jack. A friendly smile played at the Lord's lips. He stood and raised his cup high. I drink to the health of the good Benedictine brothers. Thank you for your aid in restoring Lady Reddesdale back to her family. He took a long sip from his cup, then placed a hand on Isabella's shoulder. Have you kind words you wish to bestow upon our humble yet heroic company? Jack held his breath and waited for her to turn his way. His heart hammered in his ears while she kept her silence. At last, she started to look up, but it was not Jack's gaze she sought. She shook her head, looking up at her betrothed. I have nothing to say. Jack's nostrils flared. Her rejection cut deep. Brother Peter, the abbot said quietly, leaning past Quinn to look at Jack. Your face has gone from red to purple. Remember the robe you wear. A monk does not look with daggers at his host. Jack shifted his gaze to his food and took a deep breath. Did you eat my pigeon pie? He whispered accusingly to Quinn. Weesh, Jack, Quinn whispered. Get a hold of yourself. Pigeon pie was three courses ago. Jack leaned back while a servant removed his untouched plate and set yet another course in front of him. The waste provoked his ire to new heights. He pushed the bench back and stood. It was either leave that very moment or reveal the truth of his identity by behaving in the most unholy manner. Another second within the hall while she dangled her lord and her wealth in front of him and he was going to storm the high dais and beat Lord Trevelyan to within an inch of his life. Brother Peter! Quinn hissed, but Jack ignored him and convention altogether. He rose and stormed around the table and straight out the door. He had come for Bella, but she was nowhere to be found. In her stead was the Lady Reddesdale, cold and confined, and of no interest to him. Chapter 13 Isabella fought to conceal her panic as she watched Jack storm from the great hall. Brother Peter must be ill, she said to Hugh, maintaining a casual tone. Hugh stood and offered her his hand. See that his needs are met, but do not stay away long. He kissed her hand. She dipped in a low curtsy and walked calmly from the high dais, despite how she longed to race after Jack, which is just what she did the instant after the door to the great hall shut behind her. She tore down the hallway and out into the courtyard. Scanning the shadows, she strained to glimpse his silhouette in the darkness. Brother Peter? She called when he passed under torchlight near the stable doors. He stopped, but did not turn around. She rushed to his side and grabbed his hand. You must allow me to explain myself she said, pulling him into the stables. He followed her, but then jerked his hand free from her hold and crossed his arms over his chest. You've already said enough. 
torchlight from the courtyard cast a dim glow inside the stables. She could just make out the stony set to his lips and the hard glint in his dark eyes. She swallowed the knot in her throat. But I have said nothing. I could not speak to you, not in front of you and my father. He threw his hands up. <laughs> of course you couldn't. How could the great Lady Reddesdale condescend to address a commoner? She grabbed the front of his robe and pressed herself against him. I dared not look at you or speak to you in front of them, she hissed. She held her breath, her heart aching in her chest. She stared up into his midnight eyes. I was afraid they would guess my feelings for you. His shoulders and face softened. Bella, he whispered, wrapping his arms around her. She leaned into him, her body flooded with warmth. Bella, he said louder, his voice hoarse. He crushed her against him, his gaze boring into hers. Say it, Bella. Her heart quaked. Breathless, she wrapped her arms around his neck and closed her eyes. I've fallen in love with you, Jack. Her breath hitched when his lips claimed hers. She melted into his strong arms, his scent surrounding her. Desire burned through her veins, but her conscience fought against the flame. She pushed him away, shaking her head. Please help me, because I cannot. He reached for her, drawing her back into his arms. You can't marry him, he whispered, pressing his forehead to hers. A chill passed through her. But I do not wish to hurt him. He is my friend and a good man. Ah, too good, he growled, jerking away. The stony set to his face returned, causing her chest to tighten. But then he expelled a long breath. She watched his shoulders loosen. Slowly, he stepped back and leaned against the stable wall, closing his eyes. She ached to touch him, but her feet remained fixed to the floor. He continued to keep his gaze from hers. Her breath quickened. She fought to swallow the painful lump that had gathered in her throat. His eyes slowly started to open. He looked at her through half-closed lids. I never dreamed of a woman like you. I wouldn't have dared. Shivers shot up her spine at the sight of his sideways smile. He took a step toward her. As selfish as it may be, I want you to be mine. Tears stung her eyes. Then take me. She gestured toward one of the stalls, her heart pounding in her chest. Steal my father's horse and grab me as you once did. Ride away and do not stop until we've reached the highlands. He refused her plea with the slightest shake of his head. Her hands flew to her face. She did not want to abandon her family, but she could not imagine a life without Jack in it. Where is Mabella? He whispered, gently tugging her hands away from her face. His soft question inflamed her desire. She wanted so much to be his. She gasped as his fingers stole beneath the edge of her wimple. A soft cry tore from her lips as he pulled, ripping the fabric asunder. At once, his fingers dug into her hair. He crushed his lips against hers. She groaned, wrapping her arms around his neck, fighting to bring their bodies closer, pressing into his hard strength while she savoured the taste of him. Then suddenly he tore his lips from hers. I love you, he said, his voice hoarse. He cupped her cheeks between his hands and stroked his thumb across her lips. Run away with me, he breathed. In her heart, she already had. Reaching up, she laced her fingers behind his neck. I choose love, she whispered. I choose you. Chapter 14 Isabella stood in front of the door to the great hall with Jack at her side. Are you certain this is what you want to do? he asked. She nodded, not trusting herself to speak. As much as she longed just to run away in the night, away from Berwick, away from her duty to Hugh and from her father's pain, her conscience bade her stay to say goodbye. Wait, she said when Jack reached for the handle. She gathered her hair and knotted it at the nape of her neck. Then she squared her shoulders and drew a deep breath. I am ready now. Jack swung the door wide. She stepped through. The high dais was empty. She knew her father had retired to the solar for the night. 
A pang stabbed at her heart as she pictured him there, alone with his misery. She shook her head, forcing her mind to stay focused. First, she had to deal with Hugh, who was sitting with Quinn and the other monks at one of the long tables. A sad smile tugged at her lips as she watched him throw his head back, his easy laughter ringing out at something the abbot had said. She would always love Hugh. He was her dearest friend, a brother to her soul, but she was never meant to be his wife. Her stomach twisted as she set off across the room. He looked up when she approached the table. Concern instantly furrowed his brow. He rose. Bella, what has happened to you? His fingertips reached out, tucking a wayward lock of her hair behind her ear. She ignored his question, not wishing to explain that her wimple was in tatters on the stable floor. May we speak? She said, her voice low. In private. The concern she had glimpsed in his eyes changed to weariness. His shoulders stiffened. Nodding, he gestured for her to go in front of him. Jack watched as Bella turned stiffly on her heel. Hugh shot him a suspicious look before he followed after her. Together, they disappeared behind the screen at the rear of the high dais. Abbot Matthew cleared his throat, drawing Jack's gaze. Don't look at me like that, Jack says as he turned away from the abbot's stern eyes. Ready your swords, the older man said dryly. You're a fool if you think he'll give her up without a fight. I should have stolen her when I had the chance, Jack muttered, his eyes trained on the screen. But Bella had assured him that neither her father nor Hugh would force her to stay. Remember who my mother was, she had said. At the time, he had bit his tongue, feeling he should not point out that, although her mother had been a commoner, she was also the daughter of a wealthy merchant, whereas he was a penniless thief. After some time, a door slammed. Jack rose when he heard the stomp of footsteps approach. He glanced at Quinn. Do not interfere. Then he planted his feet wide, keeping his arms lax at his sides. He was the larger man by far. Still, he had resolved not to fight back against Hugh unless he threatened his very life. Hugh barreled around the screen and headed toward him with fists clenched, his veins straining against his neck. Jack stiffened, readying his body to absorb the fullness of Hugh's fury. Only steps away now, Hugh pulled back his fist, his nostrils flared. Jack closed his eyes the instant before Hugh's knuckles ploughed into his jaw. Pain shot through his skull. He fell back, landing hard on the ground. Heavy footfalls retreated through the hall, the noise pounding Jack's head. You deserved that, didn't you? Jack lifted his eyelids, just enough to see Quinn standing above him. Aye, that I did, he said, reaching out his hand. Where did he go? Quinn pulled him to his feet. Back the way he came. I presume to try to convince Bella to forget your common thieving Scottish hide. Jack shook his head, then winced, regretting the action. Now what do we do? Quinn asked. I do not ken, Jack snapped. Tis not every day I steal a lady from her betrothed. He found a seat on one of the benches. I suppose we wait for Bella now. After what felt like an age to Jack's throbbing head, though it had really been just a matter of minutes, Bella came out from behind the screen with her father and Hugh in tow. Her pain-stricken eyes locked with his. He started toward her, But then the doors to the hall burst open. A man, who emanated authority, but appeared to have fewer than forty years to his credit, stormed into the room with two guards at his side. His velvet mantle swished about his hips as he turned to scan the hall. His lip curled with open disgust. Lord Percy, I did not grant you entry. Surprised, Jack glanced back at Isabella's father, whose voice had echoed off the ceiling. Lord Redisdale stepped in front of Bella, as if shielding her. His eyes flashed with anger. Jack could not believe his transformation from frail shadow to defender. Jack swung back around and eyed the intruder. Even he had heard of Lord Percy, who was counted among King Edward's favoured advisers. Lord Percy's pale blue eyes narrowed on Lord Redisdale with naked contempt. 
You were remiss in not sending word of your daughter's return, he said. I had to hear it from a servant. The word servant flicked off his tongue as if expelling a disease from his body. Bella's father stepped forward. No more remiss than the king not sending me word straight away of her attack. Lord Percy's eyes flashed. How dare you reprimand the king? I will when his folly pertains to my daughter. Lord Reddisdale shot back. Lord Percy gave pause. Then a cocky smile slowly spread his lips wide. I will not lie, David. Even though you chased away the messenger I sent last time I called for your support, I came here expecting a very different reception. Scottish peasants attacked your daughter. You should be at Berwick Castle as we speak, begging King Edward to retaliate. Lord Reddesdale gestured to Jack. Brother Peter witnessed the attack. He is convinced those responsible were not peasants, Scottish or otherwise. Jack stepped forward to show his support for Isabella's father. Still, Lord Percy did not bother to glance his way. He stared hard at Lord Reddesdale. Coward! he spat. If my daughter was attacked and her virtue assaulted, I would see those guilty brought to justice. Wait! Jack said, locking eyes with Lord Percy. I told no one of her near rape. He stalked toward the English lord. I intentionally left that detail out, thinking it would distress Lord Reddesdale unnecessarily. Jack stopped a breath from the English lord. Images of fine swords and tattered clothing flashed in his mind. It was you, Jack snarled. Those were your men, dressed to look like peasants. Prove it, Lord Percy hissed. I just did. Jack grabbed his tunic and slammed his body into the wall. He shot a sidelong glance at Percy's men, but Quinn and the Reddesdale guard had them surrounded. What of your vows, Brother Peter? Lord Percy sneered. A slow smile curved Jack's lips. He pressed his forearm hard against Lord Percy's throat, then leaned close and whispered in his ear, I'm not a monk. From beneath his robe, Jack produced a dagger, the tip of which he jabbed against Percy's throat. I'm a thief. My sins are many, and I don't mind adding your murder to the list. Lord Percy's eyes narrowed. You're one of the masked bandits who stole the girl from my men. Jack shrugged. You aren't in a good position to make accusations. Brother Peter, release him. Jack glanced over his shoulder. Lord Reddesdale stood behind him. His eyes held a feverish gleam. Jack moved aside but kept his dirk at the ready. Lord Reddesdale stepped closer. You ordered your men to attack and rape my daughter? He said, his voice soft and deadly. Lord Percy spat on the ground. <coughs> she is the daughter of a commoner, a whore whom you have mourned for the last five years, when you should have been at court paying homage to your king. My king? Lord Reddesdale said, as if he could not believe Lord Percy had dared to speak those words. Jack watched Lord Reddesdale's hands curl into tight fists. His chest heaved. My king! Lord Reddesdale's voice thundered off the high ceilings. He raised his clenched fists in the air, threw his head back and raged. He killed my wife! My heart! He cried, beating his chest with his own fist. He is no king! He seized Lord Percy, ah! throwing him to the floor and straddling him. He pulled his fist back and slammed it down, hammering Lord Percy's face again and again. Blood gushed from his nose and mouth and splattered the wall. Lord Reddesdale snarled and grabbed Lord Percy's tunic with both hands, lifting his bloodied head off the ground. I denounce him! Lord Reddesdale bellowed in his face. Do you hear me? I denounce King Edward! Lord Reddesdale's chest heaved as he stood dragging Percy toward the door. Get out of my house! One of the Reddesdale guards grabbed Lord Percy from his lord's hands and tossed him at the feet of his men, who lifted him up and carried him from the hall. 
but before the door closed behind them, Lord Percy shouted, I will see you drawn and quartered! Doom closed in around Isabella, choking the breath from her lungs. She grabbed Jack's hand. Why did he say that? Jack raked his free hand through his hair. Your dad just announced King Edward. He's guilty of treason. You have to go. Isabella whirled around and looked at Hugh, who had spoken the rushed words. His hands gripped his hair. Terror had widened his eyes. You have to go, he said louder, coming toward her. It will not take Lord Percy long to gather his men. He will come back. You and your father will be arrested. You will be sent to the tower. And your father will be put to death. The abbot came forward. I fear Lord Hugh is correct. The room started to spin. Oh, God. Her knees gave way, but Hugh caught her. Listen to me, Hugh said. You and your father must run. You cannot delay. Hugh turned to Jack. Ride north, and do not stop until you have run out of land. Edward will hunt for them. Hugh looked back to her. Tears stung her eyes. He pulled her close. I have never imagined life without you. If only I had... He shook his head. No, it is too late. He cupped her cheeks. Be Jack's, or someone else's. I don't care. I only care that you live. Promise me you will live. She nodded through her tears. I promise, she said, her heart pounding. Hugh drew a shaky breath and he stepped back. Then he turned to Jack. Do not delay. A moment later, Hugh was gone. Isabella gripped her stomach while she watched Hugh leave her house and her life forever. The room was spinning. Do not panic, Bella, Jack said, grabbing her shoulders. Swallowing down her tears, she nodded, gaining strength from his midnight eyes. She turned to her father. I do not regret what I said, Bella. His voice broke. I spoke the truth. A truth I have swallowed every day since the last time I brought your mother home. For the first time in years, her father's eyes shone bright and clear. A sob tore from her throat and she threw her arms around his neck. Listen to me, both of you. "'Tis imperative that we leave now,' Jack said. She looked over her shoulder at Jack. Her eyes narrowed on the vein pulsing at his neck. She nodded, then turned back to her father. She took hold of his hands and brought them to her lips. Then she said, "'Papa, we must go.' Lord Reddesdale's eyes darted about the hall. "'But what of our home? Our things?' Jack's fist came down hard on the table behind her, causing her to jump. "'They're no longer yours.' he growled. The only possession you have now is your life and the lives of your daughters. Bella's heart sank. Katerina. She grabbed Jack's arm. My sister's husband. He is not a kind man. There is no telling what he might do. Jack squeezed her hand, then turned to Quinn. Ride to Ravensworth Castle and retrieve the Lady Katerina. Quinn nodded and bowed low to Isabella. Lifting his head, his dark eyes smiled up at her. Fear not, Bella. I will steal your sister away. Without another word, he turned on his heel and raced from the hall. Jack, Abbot Matthew said, we must hurry. We'll leave the wagon and help ourselves to Lord Reddesdale's horses. Jack nodded and grabbed Isabella's elbow, pulling her toward the door. Wait, she said. Jack shook his head. No more delays, Bella. But would not coin be helpful to us? She said. He threw his hands up. Aye. Coin is always helpful. She pressed a kiss to his lips, then turned to her father and reached into his pocket, retrieving a key. I will be right back, she said before racing from the hall and up the stairs to her father's solar. Unlocking the large chest beside his bed, she grabbed several bags of coin and her mother's jewels. Piling everything into a leather satchel, she swung the bag over her shoulder and raced back to the hall. We are ready, Jack, she said, barreling into the room. Why does everyone keep calling him Jack? Her father said. I thought his name was Brother Peter. Isabella grabbed his arm. I'll explain after we've escaped with our lives. Chapter 15 They had left Berwick at a gallop and did not slow their pace until just after dawn when they reached monastic land. 
The abbot and his monks continued on toward the monastery while Jack, Bella and Lord Redisdale disappeared into the woods. Jack expelled a tense breath. For years the forest had hidden him and his family away, allowing their crimes to go unpunished. The trees had been watchful guardians, to which he entrusted those he loved most, and would no doubt give them sanctuary one last time. Patches of mist circled around jutting rocks and wove through the underbrush, painting the earth in white shadow. His appreciative gaze followed the ghostly wisps. He smiled, dropping the reins. While his horse picked its own way toward camp, he wrapped both arms around Bella's waist. She smiled up at him. The morning sun slanted through the leaves, streaking her unbound sable waves with gold. He absently wove his fingers through her hair as he bent his neck back, admiring the tangled green canopy overhead. Having glimpsed the cold interior of a great fortress, the richness of the forest struck Jack as never before. Trees like sentinels creaked in the wind, announcing their return as they rode into camp. The pit fire burned bright, and the log seats were fully occupied by three of his brothers, his wee lassies, Rose, and one unexpected visitor. Jack frowned when he met Bishop Lamberton's stern gaze, but an instant later, a chorus of girlish squeals erupted as his lassies raced toward him. He slid from his horse with Bella in his arms, and set her down in time to feel the impact of five girls' unabashed delight. Jack! They cried. Let him breathe, lassies, Rose said. Jack reached over the girls and gave Rose a quick hug, knowing it was Bella who actually held Rose's interest. My lady, you're back, Rose said, turning to the woman at his side. Jack smiled down at Bella, who had reached out to embrace his sister. I never thought I would see you or this place again, Bella said. Rose's eyes welled with tears. Are you here to stay? No, Rose. Jack said. His sister's eyes flashed at him. He threw his hands up in mock surrender. None of us are. Rose arched her brow at him. What is that supposed to mean? I'll explain. (laughs) Jack said, laughing as Florrie shouldered her way past Moira to hug his leg. Welcome back, Ian said, picking his way around the girls. Where's Quinn? Rory stepped forward. Aye, Jack. Where's Quinn? Before Jack could answer, a throat cleared behind him. He turned and looked at Bishop Lamberton. Judging by your present company, the bishop said, looking pointedly at Lord Redisdale, you clearly have much to explain. However, I insist you first remove the robe you wear. Jack nodded, peeling Florrie off his leg. Forgive me, bishop. I meant no offence. Jack disappeared into his hut emerging minutes later divested of his monastic robes. As he walked back toward the fire, he smiled when he saw Bella's appreciative gaze travel from his tall black boots, past his black hose, to the black tunic belted at his waist. She smiled her approval. He fought the urge to sweep her up into his arms and retreat back to his hut. With regret, he turned from her and looked at her father. Lord Redisdale, I would like you to meet Bishop Lamberton, My brothers, Ian, Rory and Alec, my sister Rose, and my wee lassies, Moira, Flory, Anna, Mary, and Maggie. Ian was the first to step forward. He bowed, but Bella's father shook his head. You need not bow, lad. I am lord of nothing now, expect my own conscience. I have, or rather I will in due course, be stripped of my titles and wealth. Jack crossed the glade to his horse and pulled the satchel of coin out of his saddlebags, giving it to Lord Redisdale. Your claim of poverty is not entirely true. How has this come to be? Bishop Lamberton said, his eyes darting between Lord Redisdale and Jack. Jack cleared his throat. (coughs) In short, Lord Redisdale... Please, Jack, Lord Redisdale interrupted. Call me David. Jack smiled and nodded. David has denounced King Edward, and is now guilty of treason. The bishop's eyes widened with surprise. Then your lives are in danger. That is the truth of the matter, David said. Jack nodded. We must leave. All of us, he said, raising his voice for his family to hear. Wait, Ian grabbed Jack's arm. What of Quinn? Is he hurt? 
Jack shook his head. Quinn has journeyed to Ravensworth Castle to retrieve Isabella's sister. Now that Katarina is no longer a lady, Bella and David fear her husband will not honour their marriage. Or worse, Bella chimed in. Brows drawn, Rory asked, What are the rest of us to do? We must flee, Jack said. Doubtless Edward has men already searching for our trail. Something pulled at Jack's tunic. He looked down at Florrie's smiling face. Is it time to play yet? She said. He squatted down and motioned for all of his lassies to come to him. Nay, lassies, we cannot play, for we are going on an adventure, and I need all my girls to help Rose with preparations. Where will we go? Rose asked. To the Isle of Collinsey, he said. Then he turned to Bella and David. Our father's people come from there. I am confident we will be welcomed. But what of the other children, Jack? Ian said. Jack pressed his eyes closed to think. He had not considered the dozens of other children still reliant on his support. We've stolen coin hidden away in the hole, Alex said, his voice flat and his eyes downcast. That should keep them fed for a while. Isabella whirled around to face Alec. He must have sensed her gaze because he looked up. She had never seen his face up close. His long black hair fell across eyes as black as Jack's. Show me the hole, she said. She followed him down the path that led to the stream where she, Rose and the lassies had enjoyed their picnic. Before too long, he stepped off the path toward a patch of dense thicket. "'Tis there," he said. She stared him hard in the eye. He remained aloof, his face like finely carved wood. Beautiful, but unchanging. She circled around him and parted the brush and saw the black hole, though she dared not look down. Bella arched her brow at him. This is where you wanted to stick me? Alex shrugged. Ah, it seemed a good idea at the time. She stalked up to him and brushed a lock of black hair from his eyes. Despite his shield of impassivity, she could feel his power as one feels the strength of a caged animal. Then she remembered Rose confessing that he had the sight. You feel nothing to keep from feeling everything, she blurted. His expression never altered. Let's go he said. Then, without another word, he turned around and headed back toward camp. She followed after and remembered Rose telling her that she had a special place for Alec in her heart. Now Bella understood why. He was so cold and distant, it would have been hard to love him otherwise. Back at camp, a bustle of activity was underway. She crossed to where her father stood. Are you well, Papa? You seem confused. He smiled. I am not confused, perhaps a trifle overwhelmed. As far as I can tell, Rose and Jack's lassies are coming with us, but Jack and Bishop Lamberton appear to disagree on whether or not his brother should come. Jack raked his fingers through his hair as he looked hard at the bishop. I cannot divide my family. Do you think they will be safer with you? The bishop replied. You are on the run, Jack. There will be a price on your head but your brothers are still unknown, traceless. The bishop paused, drawing a deep breath. <sighs> Damn it, Jack. Scotland still needs saints. Jack pressed his lips together while he thought. Then they will have to decide for themselves. Rory, who had been standing by, chimed in straight away. I'm sorry, Jack, but the cause is in my blood. I want to stay and be useful to the bishop. I want to fight for Scotland. Jack closed his eyes against the tightening in his chest. Instinct bade he fight to keep his family together. Still, at two and twenty, Rory was a man. He met Rory's pale blue gaze. A tiny isle is no place for you. At least not now. But mind you're careful. Stay out of trouble and stick to the code. Then Jack crossed the glade to where Alex stood alone. He waited for Alec to look at him, or speak his choice, but his younger brother remained silent, his eyes fixed on the ground. After several long moments passed, Jack had his answer. He pulled Alec into a fierce hug. Make your way to Collinsey one day, he said. Then he stepped back and looked to his youngest brother. Ian was sitting on the ground, letting Moira braid his long, tangled red hair. What say ye? Jack said then held his breath. Ian looked up at Jack. 
Bishop Lamberton is right. You're an outlaw now, and so are Bella and David. You cannot run with five wee ones. I will take Rose and the lassies to Collinsey myself. We will strike out on our own. Jack expelled the breath he'd been holding. He placed his hand on his youngest brother's wide shoulder. <sighs> Thank you, Ian. Bishop Lamberton stepped forward then. I will ensure the other children are taken care of, which settles matters. Now, you must put some distance between you and Edward's soldiers. Jack clasped his offered hand. Thank you for everything. The bishop smiled. You have given more than your share to the cause, Jack. Now is your chance for that peaceful life I know you dream about, when you think no one is looking. Jack winked and wrapped his arm around Bella's waist. I am already there. Chapter 16 Her soul soared to the tops of the surrounding mountains. She breathed the fresh crisp air and felt its elusive truth, untamed, unpredictable. And now, for the first time, so was she. She nudged her yeah. horse in the flanks, skirting jagged rocks and rugged, jutting slopes. Storm clouds gathered, climbing up the mountains. A crack of lightning sliced the sky, unleashing torrents of heavy rain. She threw her head back and cried out as wild as any creature ever to cross mountain or moor. She looked back. Her father huddled beneath his cape, but a smile stretched his face wide. He had been delivered up from his grief. This was a new world, one far from pain. After a while, the dark clouds scattered, releasing the sun's warmth and light. The road wound around craggy boulders and small forests of scotch pine and then straightened, running alongside a large field left to follow. At its edge, they passed a blacksmith's forge. Black plumes of smoke coiled out from rooftop vents. Further down, they came to a village green with a small stone kirk at its centre. Few people milled about the sleepy hamlet but those who were crossing the green or bringing wheat to the mill beyond the kirk stopped and stared at Bella, Jack and David. Your clothes are too rich, Jack said under his breath. Your da's too. She looked down at her sodden yet fine tunic with its intricate embroidery and golden threads. Bella looked about. Where is the tailor? He threw his head back and laughed. <laughs> ah, there is no tailor. Not for miles and miles. Bella, most people make their own clothes. She blushed while at the same time squaring her shoulders. Then I must learn. Ah, I think that is a fine idea, Jack said. But it does not solve our immediate problem. Your tunic invites suspicion. True, she said looking about. Then she spied a young woman with a basket of laundry in her arms passing between two huts. She looked at Jack. Wait for me at the outskirts of the village. Jack and her father exchanged sceptical glances. What are you planning to do? David said. Just go, she said. When neither man moved, she scowled. Fine, I will go. She nudged her horse forward, following after the girl and her basket. Bella spotted her near the edge of a field. She was laying out clothes on top of tall grasses. After the girl had emptied her basket, Bella waited until she was out of sight before scurrying into the brush to steal what they needed. She snatched a kirtle and a tunic for herself and a pair of hose and a tunic for her father. Then she dropped several coins into the pocket of an apron spread out under the fleeting sunshine. Her heart pounded as she ran back to her horse. Shoving the items into her bag, she pulled herself up into her saddle and made a dash for the road. Let's ride! She shouted, passing Jack and her father. She continued her race long after the village had disappeared from sight. God above, forgive her. But she felt incredible. They rode until the sun began to dip in the sky. Jack led them to another village. This one was larger and offered accommodations for travellers. Ah, oh, thank goodness, David said to Bella, when Jack left them to talk to the proprietor of a bustling alehouse. For the first time in years, my limbs are filled with vigour. Still, I do not believe I am quite ready to sleep out of doors. Luck is on our side, 
Jack said when he returned. We've the last two rooms. A wave of relief passed over her father's face, the instant before his brows drew together with concern. Prepare yourself, daughter. Our room is sure to offer little by way of comfort. Jack cleared his throat. <coughs> David, you're bedding down on your own. Bella's heart started to pound. She met Jack's hot gaze. But where do you intend to sleep? David asked Jack, and then his breath caught as his eyes darted between Jack and Bella. Surely you do not intend to share a room with my daughter. Jack drew back a step. That is exactly my intention. He threw his hands out. But do not fash yourself. First, I plan to wed her. Bella looked at Jack. A shiver shot up her back, curling her toes. She could not draw breath. Her heart raced. That is, if you'll have me, he said, his voice soft and low. He reached out and grazed the backs of his fingers down her cheek. She threw her arms around his neck. Nothing could make me happier. But then, remembering her father, she stiffened and drew away. Papa? She said, her eyes pleading for him to understand her heart. A scowl furrowed her father's brow. In that moment, he was every bit Lord Redisdale. The relieved and spirited David had vanished. Of all the offensive improper, his voice trailed off as he looked about the room, clearly scanning the rustic surroundings, the simple tables and coarse inhabitants. When he looked at her once more, his face had softened. David had returned. He stepped forward and cupped her cheek. It seems my new life demands I relinquish control. A daunting but not unwelcome task. I have no qualms with the match, if this is where your heart lies. He has proved himself to be an intelligent man of great heart. More than that, he clearly loves you. He turned his gaze to Jack. I could ask nothing more for my Bella. Then his smile faded. But forgive me for saying so. You do already have a lot of children. Bella laughed outright. <laughs> Jack's lassies are not of his body, Papa. They are simply in his charge. Once more her father appeared confused. She pressed a kiss to his cheek. When we have reached Collinsey, I will tell you everything. Her wedding was perfect, with none of the pomp and frivolities of noble custom. They did not even stand for mass. She wore her stolen dress of homespun wool. Jack had made her a crown of wild flowers, which he had laid on her unbound hair. On her father's arm, she walked the short length of the common room and stood in front of the local priest who, as fortune would have it, had been at one of the tables enjoying a mug of ale. In just a few short minutes, they were married, and she did not think she could have waited a minute more. The look of hunger in Jack's eyes was a mirror of her own desire. Shall we feast, David said proudly pointing to a large spread of baked apples, stewed chestnuts, meat pies, bannock and ale. God above, but the last thing she wanted at that moment was to sit down and eat. She looked at Jack. The pulse at his neck raced. Her feet pointed toward the stair. His fists clenched and unclenched at his sides. Finally, she forced a smile to her lips and was about to thank her father and sit down when an old woman in a voluminous black cloak drew near. Can't you see they're not hungry? The old woman said to David. At least not for food. She turned and winked at Bella. She had soft, kind grey eyes and silvery hair pulled back from her face, which was creased with age. She sat down next to David. As for me... Well, it's been a good while since I sat down to such a feast. She reached for one of the small pies and took a bite. Mmm, eel, delicious, she mumbled as she chewed. Then she washed it down with a sip of ale. Didn't they have pigeon? she asked. Bella pressed her lips together to keep from laughing at the appalled look on her father's face. First giving Bella a sly smile, the old woman then turned back to David. Surely you were young once, she said with a wink. Would you believe that I was? David said to her. The old woman smiled. I would. 
And I also believe you were once truly loved by a woman. A distant look clouded her father's eyes, and a slight smile curved his lips. Indeed I was, he whispered. Leaning back in his chair, he looked up at Bella. I wish you both every happiness, he said softly. Tears filled Bella's eyes. Are you certain, Papa? David nodded. I will be fine. Then he turned to the old woman at his side. What is your name? Gertrude, she replied. It is a pleasure to meet you, David said, before turning back to Bella. Gertrude will keep me company. Thank you, Papa, Bella whispered. Then she wrapped her arms around Jack's neck and lost herself in his black eyes. Jack opened the door. She passed into the small room. With one sweep of her eyes, she took in the simple bed, table and two chairs and small chest. And then the room was forgotten. The door slammed behind her. She whirled around and opened her arms just as he reached for her. He tore the flower crown from her head and sent it soaring across the room. Then his fingers dug into her hair and he crushed her mouth against his. His tongue dove between her lips, unlocking her hunger. His hands cupped her cheeks and then her neck and then caressed down her shoulders. He tore his lips away. His black eyes were hard and heavy. He grabbed her tunic and yanked it over her head. Her kirtle quickly followed. She was bare to his midnight eyes. He drew a shaky breath and ran a finger slowly down her breastbone to her navel and then, slower still, sweeping his fingers across the curls at the apex of her thighs. Her legs trembled. Ache shuddered where he had touched. He stepped back and jerked free from his clothes. Her eyes raked over the hard lines of his chest and stomach. His smell surrounded her, drawing her in. She reached out and grazed the crisp, black hair fanning across his chest. His breathing quickened and his skin shone with sweat. She leaned close and pressed her lips to the hollow of his neck, savouring the salt taste of him. With a groan, he pulled her against him. Then he bent his head and breathed hot currents of air over her hardened nipples. She cried out when his teeth lightly bit down, drawing first one sensitive peek into his mouth and then the other. Moving his lips slowly down her stomach, his fingers pressed her thighs apart. He sank to his knees, gripped her buttocks and pulled the wet heat of her to his lips. She threw her head back and cried out as fire, hot and searing, coursed through her. Her breath hitched. She whimpered. Agonising need begged her hips to tilt into his kiss. Cooler teased her desire when he pulled away and roughly grabbed her waist. He threw her down in the bed and covered her with his full weight, kissing her, fueling the flames of yearning. He grasped her hips so hard it hurt as, slowly, he pressed his hard, thick length inside of her. Her fingers bit into his shoulders. She flung her head back, arching her chest, writhing beneath him as he pumped his body into hers, each thrust harder than the last. She reached, climbing higher and higher until at last, her body seized. She shuddered around him as wave after wave of sweet relief coursed through her body. Bella awoke to Jack lightly tracing the tip of finger around the pink moon of her nipple. Through bleary eyes she smiled and nuzzled close to him. Then her eyes flew open. She sat up. Something just occurred to me. He rolled over onto his back and laced his fingers behind his head. Aye, and what is that? She leaned out of bed and scooped her tunic off the floor. I stole this. He smiled. But we already knew that. She started to laugh. What's so funny? He asked. <laughs> You and I are married. He frowned. Although I don't see the humour in that, we are, indeed, married. There's an alehouse full of witnesses able to attest to that fact. She could not contain her laughter. Are you going to tell me what you find so amusing, wife? She hiccuped and nodded. Reaching her arms around his neck, she said, It just occurred to me that I am now a thief, an outlaw, a commoner and a Scotswoman. You and I are now a perfect match. He smiled and pulled her closer. 
Then he rolled over, pushing her back onto the bed. I hope this does not disappoint you, but I believe my thieving days are over. In truth, you married a fisherman. I think that fine, she said, reaching up to cup his cheek. But you will always be the thief of my heart. And ye, he said, his voice low and husky, will always be my princess. Epilogue Jack gripped his fishing boat and bent low, pressing his shoulder into the stern. All right, lads, put your backs into it, he called to Ian and David, who flanked the boat on either side. They trudged forward, the hull carving into the sand. Icy water lapped Jack's calves, swallowing the shore out from beneath his feet. A moment later, the surf barreled forward, churning once more around his legs. This dance continued until they had moved the boat beyond the ocean's hungry reach. He straightened and stretched his back, then wiped at the beads of sweat on his forehead with the back of his hand. Are you well? He said, sitting down on the sand next to David, who was trying to catch his breath. David's white hair stood on end in the wind. Dirt and dried salt streaked his ruddy face. He looked at Jack warmly. I would be lying if I said that I've never felt happier. However, if I cannot have my Annunziata at my side, then I can tell you with the greatest sincerity, there is no place I would rather be. Jack smiled and fell back in the sand. The hot summer sun had begun to dip behind the horizon, making way for cool evening breezes which poured off the waves. The music of the calm ocean matched the beat of his heart. Look, Ian called. Here they come! Jack sat up. His lassies splashed through the ebbing waves while Bella and Rose walked a little behind, both with deep baskets strapped to their backs to carry the day's catch back to their croft. A slow smile curved Jack's lips as he watched Bella approach. Water lapped her bare feet. The wind whipped her tunic against one side of her body, hugging her curves. His eyes traced along the outline of her sleek waist and the flare of her hip. Her hair streaked with pale gold, lashed out behind her, lifting and tangling in the salty air. Her eyes locked with his. A smile, sweet and sensual, curved her lips as she drew closer. When she reached his side, she sank to her knees and pulled the basket from her shoulders. Then she lay her head on his chest. He closed his eyes and savoured the feel of her, more precious to him than anything he could have ever imagined. He wrapped his arm around her and stroked her hair. She raised her head and looked at him, her pale green eyes luminescent next to her skin now deeply tanned by the sun. He grazed his fingers down her soft cheek and throat, then slowly over her shoulder. He frowned when he noticed a hole in the sleeve of her tunic. He absently picked at the frayed threads. Do you miss your life the way it was? He said. Your fine tunics and servants. Her eyes widened for an instant and then grew serious. She cupped his cheeks between her hands. You listen to me, Jack McBee. All I want is you. She sat up and pointed to Rose and the lassies, trying to get as close to the waves as they could without getting wet. And them, she said, laughing. Then she jumped to her feet and spread her arms wide, smiling at the heavens. And this, she cried. Sandy shores, crashing waves... Jura's mountains in the distance. She plunked down in the sand once more and wrapped her arms around his neck, pulling him to lay back on the sand. Look! She cried. He followed her outstretched arm, pointing to the sky at a golden eagle soaring into the clouds. Then she touched his cheek, drawing his gaze. Her warm breath caressed his skin. Thank you, she whispered. For what? he asked his voice low, for giving me a wonderful life. Thank you so much for watching. If you would like to enjoy more videos like this one, click the thumbs up button and subscribe to our channel. See you next time out in the Highlands.